here in the Calais refugee camp, which is also known as the jungle, there are currently about six and a half thousand residents who are refugees. The main people living here are from countries in North Africa and the Middle East. People have travelled from um, situations of persecution or conflict. This camp isn't actually a formally set up camp. It's mostly been built by refugees themselves with the support of volunteers. And it's a motley collection of tents and shelters that have been hand built. You wouldn't imagine a place like this in northern France. Our project is Art Refuge UK, we're a small UK charity. Working with Médecins Sans Frontières and Médecins du Monde, we're a charity that works through art and art therapy with displaced populations and refugees. I'm Jess, I'm an art therapist with Art Refuge UK here in Calais. I think it's really useful for them to be able to start through an art making process or a material. And we've also had a map that we've been using in the space in response to lots of people coming in and gradually telling us who they are, where they've come from, what their journey might have been to get here and also where they want to go. From the floor, the bus to Khartoum. Then from Khartoum with the bus up to Wadi Haifa. So there's quite immediate um, feelings of anxiety, stress, anger, and then also there are lots of conversations and, and workings through of the journeys they've had let alone the experiences that they've often had in their own countries, which has pushed them to needing to, to leave to find safety. How long has he been staying in Calais then? Five months. Five I had a very good life in Iran. I had a good job, but I encountered political problems. I paid smugglers and I traveled with their help. So far, I have paid 25,000 euros in smugglers' fees. We don't tell our families that the conditions here are bad, but it is worse than hell. I kind of draw a face and then add the almond-shaped velvet eyes, and then I draw the nose, and then I go, did I make the nose too big? And then I check back with the photos and go, no, her nose definitely is that big. And then I had the hair, I'd get a, uh, a big fat black brush pen to get a load of hair in there, draw the hair, go, did I make the hair too big? Take the photos, go, no, the hair's definitely that big. Add a bit more. <laughs> That's the general way I draw Rosa Luxemburg. Make her really small and then put all the other people in around the top of the frame, as they probably would have been. <laughs> Rosa Luxemburg was born in 1871. She was a tiny, crippled, female, Jewish refugee who ended up being an economist, a journalist, a lecturer, and a revolutionary socialist. A time when that wasn't really a common career option for a woman. We don't know that much about her childhood, so there's just little snippets that have been told. We do know that she was involved in socialism from a very young age, possibly even before she left school at the age of 15. At that time, people were being hanged for socialist activity, so it was dangerous. It would have been easier to have become a socialist then is that all the inequality was in the same place. You'd have your super, super rich people travelling around in carriages, and then you have all the 
workers who were, who are literally dying of overwork and literally starving to death. And it's happening in the same town, it's happening in the same city. This is a quote that I've got from Orwell, well, a paraphrase from Orwell. Of course, the poor don't feel things the same way that we do. We should suffer dreadfully if we had to live like that, but they really don't mind. And her friend's going, quite so. Now, Rosa here is looking a bit murderous, and she's got a knife out. I'm not sure what she's going to do next. But in fact, she's taking a quote that she really said, she really wrote. I don't think she wrote it in a school desk. I want to burden the conscience of the affluent with all the suffering and all the hidden bitter tears. For over 50 years, the music of Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, was the most popular in Africa, a form of artistic expression that grew up with a modern city. It was cosmopolitan in its influences and based on Cuban sun, a style of music enjoying global popularity in the 1930s and 40s. Played on modern instruments, and sang in Lingala, the first smash hit record was Marie Louise, a song that rejects traditional authority. Written by Wendo Colosoy and Henri Boanet in 1948, the song was so popular it was said that the dead rose from their graves to dance to it. While the lyrics of Congolese music appear to be about love, their context is often political. Before independence, Leopoldville, later known as Kinshasa, was strongly divided by race and class. The population was mostly poor and rural, but the Belgian colony and its rulers depended on a class of literate African clerks. This urban middle class began to envisage a new world, and the music bars of Kinshasa became the spaces where they developed a sense of themselves. Thirty-nine years ago, my great-great-grandfather sat with other chieftains of our nation to make treaty with representatives of the Queen. We come from a very proud nation. The indigenous people of Canada were still here, in spite of all the many ways that have been set out to maybe erase us or get people to forget about us and even sometimes to try and get us to forget about us. But we're still here. This song I'm going to sing is called the Women's Warrior Song. This song has become a 
in a sense, an anthem to honor the missing and murdered Indigenous women of Canada. second generation survivor of the Grand Holocaust in the Second World War. I found people that are survivors of the largest Holocaust ever, and a kind of Holocaust that nobody wants to talk about. That was the American Holocaust. I think we've got to recognize that cinema really most often functions as soft propaganda. It's a soft sell. The Americans were the first to realize that, even before the Soviets. Back in 1917, 1918, Americans were realizing that American cinema, just ordinary American cinema, was all good propaganda for America. In fact, there was an official committee that said, everywhere people are watching American films, they're learning American values, they're coming to you from the screen, without appearing to be trying to influence you. It's the American way of life. And I guess American cinema has always benefited from that sense that it's not seen as propagandist, mostly. It's just seen as telling stories. And that, of course, is a form of insidious, pervasive propaganda. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state. Well, I think the most striking difference in attitude after the war is that while American cinema gets really quite mobilized in terms of Cold War propaganda, this on the whole does not happen in the Soviet Union, the other player in the game. Here's a news bulletin from the nation's capital. Washington, officially this morning, denies rumors of enemy planes over northern Alaska. Meanwhile, there's been no lessening of international tension, and informed sources refuse to discount the possibility of all-out war. Shut that thing off. The space race was something which we had already seen in fiction. We already knew the stories from way back in the 19th century even, and certainly in the early 20th century. And I think people have always looked to space as a, a setting, an arena for acting out fundamental human dramas, but also, of course, the, the propaganda battles of the Cold War period. So when the defense initiative, which eventually became known as Star Wars in, in the popular press under Ronald Reagan, which was to shoot down rockets with rockets, it sounds like science and fiction. And there were serious doubts on many people's part about whether it was realistic, feasible. It sounded good. You could do animations on television. And let's not forget that the whole support for the space program and for space-based defense initiatives has always relied on very powerful visualizations being available to be shown on television. Fire their radioactive ray. 